Hello and welcome to episode two of VMware Today, uh, the podcast all about the VMware portfolio. Uh, I'm your host, Phil Sellers with Zintegra, and I'm here today with Barry Brown, my co-worker and uh, our director of solutions architecture. Barry, how are you doing today? You know, I'm, I'm, Phil, I'm good, but I want to talk to the guy who schedules these podcasts at 8 a.m. in the morning. You know, <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> It's not, it's not too bad for me. It's it's nine nine fifteen here for me, but it's it's the crack of dawn for you. I'm afraid. <laughs> hey, early bird catches the worm. That's what my dad always told me, and so uh, I try to get at it and get cracking early in the day. Um, but you do you up in Nova Scotia? You have the benefit of being an hour ahead of me. And and you know what? Um, since I moved to Zintegra, that first hour of the day has been a blessing because I get to organize my day, structure my day before I kick off with you know various customers, various projects. So. You know, it's it's great. I get to relax and make my kids a proper breakfast in the morning before, you know, the grind of, of work starts and get them settled, get them on the bus off to school and uh, then back to back to the, the desk, as it were. Uh, speaking of kids, we were talking just before the podcast. It's a pretty big week for both of our kids uh, starting their first jobs. Uh, so what's your daughter going to be doing? Uh, my daughter's going to be a host at at a memorial site. Um, so I live in a community um, where there was a big disaster many, many years ago in the late 1800s where uh, a ship, uh, a passenger ship crashed into you know rocks off the coast of Terrence Bay, which is close to close to where I live. And uh, there's several hundred people buried in a mass grave down there. And there's all kinds of artifacts washed up on the shore uh, over time. So my daughter's going to be working in the uh, the visitor center where you know folks can come in who are curious about you know what happened. Uh, with the SS Atlantic uh, many years ago, and uh, she'll she'll walk them through all the artifacts in the museum, uh, tell them the story of what happened. Um, they actually have a whole workshop that I'm going through now with my family is the the lineage of the passengers. So the, in the in the center, there's a whole plaque showing uh, showing all the last names of the folks who were on the boat, and one of them is uh, is a Brown, or Brown with an E, which is my last name, which is pretty rare outside of Europe. Um, so we're going through that workshop now, and, and uh, it's really got me interested. It brought me to the whole rabbit hole of of um, Oh man, what was that service uh, to track your your heritage? I can't remember what it was now. Ancestry. Yes, yes, yes. So I got I got stuck into that, and what? There's a way to spend some time. Holy smokes! Oh yeah, yeah. That is um, an interesting one. I've got family members who are are uh, very into tracking our ancestry and things like that. Um, funny enough, my namesake gets lost. There are tons of sellers out there. But we don't really know where my family came from. Um, we had a courthouse burn uh, in my hometown, and we lost tons and tons of records. So it's a little bit of a, a mystery where where we came from. You know what? There's an IT lesson to be told there about your three, two, one backups, <laughs> not on paper. <laughs> but it, so your your daughter's starting her new job on on Thursday. So what's she going to be doing, or her first job, I should say? So when we moved to the Charlotte area years ago, she insisted that we have annual passes to Carowinds. And so funny enough, uh, she is going to be working at Carowinds, the, the theme park here in our area. Okay, I was, I was gonna ask a question, what the heck is Carowinds? Okay, you just answered it. Yeah, so uh, it's a, a thrill park, um, lots and lots of roller coasters and other rides. And then they've also got a water park. So. Um, she had orientation last weekend. She goes in for more training on Thursday, and uh, I guess we'll we'll see what's going to to be her job or her assignment uh, here in the near future. Wow, uh, you know nothing nothing makes you feel older than your kids get joining the workforce, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, but it, on the flip side of that, before we get into the VMware stuff, at least you know the hand's not going to be out all the time. Daddy, more money, please. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was very proud of my daughter. She started asking questions about retirement accounts and how does she start something this early. Uh, learned a few lessons about the U.S. retirement accounts, and uh, uh, so we've made an agreement that she's going to go ahead and start one of those, and a percentage of what she's going to be doing uh, will go that way. So very, very happy, and and this was her idea, so I have to brag on her. Um, oh, yeah, just, absolutely. You know, it's wisdom beyond her age, for sure. Yeah, no, my daughter's more about uh, when am I getting my first paycheck so I can hit them all with my friends. <laughs> <laughs> I know that a healthy percentage is going to go to that too. So, <laughs> well, we are here to uh, talk some VMware today. You know, on our first uh, podcast, we we talked about vSphere Plus, and so for today, uh, the topic is going to be vSAN Plus. You know, one of the things that that came out organically in our conversation was vSphere Plus is uh, basically a subscription service 
that entitles you to the same things as your traditional vSphere, um, but it does not include the storage component, doesn't include vSAN. So we have another subscription service from VMware, vSAN Plus, that was introduced middle of 2022. And uh, so that's that's where we want to start today. Okay. Well, I think maybe we take a big whole step back. So, you know, your traditional enterprise, you know, they know about the three-tier three -tier architecture and, you know, storage is, is a part of that. So if I'm a customer, you know, why would I look at vSAN, never mind vSAN Plus right now, uh, vSAN as a product versus, you know, go out by, going out to buy, I you know, an Imbral array, an MSA array. Um, you know, why, why should I look at vSAN as a product? It's a great place to start. Um, you know, for me, it's about reducing the complexity, you know, reducing the need of that discrete purpose-built storage device. Uh, vSAN Plus is hyper-converged storage. Uh, it uses software uh, running on the vSphere hypervisor, and it takes locally attached disks and pulls them into a software-based SAN. So much like left hand or, um, you know, uh, I guess uh, Nutanix or SimpliVity, this is a hyper-converged uh, storage platform. And uh, it, it allows you to use commodity disks that are already, you know, available or disk slots that are already available on your existing compute nodes and uh, negates the need to, to run a separate SAN. Okay. So... Just think, think it through the architecture you just spoke about there. So if, if I'm, you know, I have 20 terabytes in my existing vSAN array, I want to add another 20 terabytes. Does that mean I should have to add uh, another node with just disk or it also needs to have compute, memory, uh, well, obviously storage. Um, so how do you expand on, on, a, on, a, on a vSAN array is, a question, is my question. So a couple different ways. So if you've got additional disk slots available in your existing nodes, you can add additional disks and disk groups. Uh, so vSAN allows you to expand in that way. Or you can, like you said, expand. If you need additional compute as well, or you don't have disk slots, you add an additional node. And so performance scales linearly, uh, as well as your capacity. So you can add on additional nodes to, to grow, or you can add inside of existing nodes to grow. Okay, so pretty pretty flexible, pretty scalable. Um, what kind of, is it your traditional kind of RAID 5 that it uses, or RAID 10, or do you, or can, can the administrator decide how they want to you know, chop up and protect your data. Yeah. So what's great about vSAN is it uses policies, storage policies. So um, unlike an individual uh, RAID controller, um, you don't have to make a single choice uh, for your disks. So uh, think about how the RAID controller, if you've got two disks, you can create a mirror. If you've got, you know, another six or seven disks, you want to create a RAID 5 set. You can do that inside of the RAID controller, and each one of those come becomes a logical um, storage location. Well, vSAN doesn't follow that exactly, but through policy, so through the, the policy you assign to a VM, you can dictate the same sort of thing. So you can say, hey, I want to have a RAID 0 or a RAID 5 or a RAID 6. Uh, for this particular VM. And then across all of the nodes and all of the disk groups inside of the vSAN, it will uh, put that policy in place and it'll balance the data. So um, you do have the control and your RAID set basically determines the number of different copies uh, outside uh, you know, for your uh, data protection. And then we have another concept uh, of failures to tolerate because this isn't uh, a singular sort of device. This is made up of multiple different compute nodes. We also have this topic of failures to tolerate. So we know that because it's a vSphere node, we're going to take it out for maintenance. We're going to have to reboot it. We may have a failure, and we certainly are going to need to do upgrades. So failure to tolerate is a concept that we use across vSAN that allows us to dictate how many copies and where they're placed within the vSAN array. So that if at any time you go into a node down situation, uh, you will not lose access to your data. So uh, in that way, we, we get this concept of a redundant array of independent nodes or RAIN uh, that's often that, that's cute. That's cute. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> rain concepts often apply to these hyper-converged infrastructures. And it's 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 again 
with that thought of maintenance and failures are going to occur. So for uh, larger clusters with workloads that are, are much more important, you may increase your failures to tolerate from one to two. You can also set it to zero. So if you've got a workload that it really doesn't matter, that it's redundant, um, then you may set it to failures to tolerate zero, then you don't have the data split in a way that, you know, it's, it, if one node goes down, this VM can go down and that's okay. Um, it's certainly a conversation to have as people, uh, as, as customers look at and start talking about vSAN, they need to understand what those FTT settings actually mean. Okay. Um well, one final question before we get on to the real topic today, but I think it's important we set the, the groundwork of what vSAN is as a product before we talk about the vSAN Plus offering. Um, so, you know, some of the traditional storage vendors before uh, NVMe and SSDs were, were a real thing, they brought in the concept of, of data tiering. You know, it's written to SSD. Um, you know, policy says if it hasn't been touched for 30 days, drop it out to colder storage or slower, you know, thicker, bigger disks that are not as expensive. Is that a concept in vSAN or no? It absolutely is. So uh, we'll, we'll talk today about traditional vSAN architecture, but uh, on our next episode, it's going to be a great topic for us to talk about the new enhanced architecture that VMware has just come out with in the last year. So I think we can do a whole conversation about where it's going with NVMe, but certainly in the traditional architecture, this, this was architected and created in, in a time where we had SSDs for acceleration and spinning disk. And so Hybrid vSAN arrays were certainly um, there. They still hold a place for large data sets with cold data. Um, and so uh, every disk group that you create has a caching device and then it has capacity devices. And so this is in the traditional vSAN architecture. Um, now your capacity devices can be spinning disks or they can be um, you know, all SSD or even NVMe in the traditional architecture. Your, Caching devices generally are going to be SSD or are required to be at least SSD, but could also be NVMe. Okay, so can you can you mix and match within you know a RAID ten disk group or it only it's only spinning Rust versus SSD versus NVMe? So yeah, within the cluster, it's going to be either a hybrid or it's going to be a uh, flash style array in the traditional architecture. Um, and then when we start talking about the enhanced architecture for our next episode. This is something that's going to be uh, all flash across the board. So uh, it is engineered for all flash. It is rewritten to accelerate and make things go really, really fast. Okay. All right. So I think in my head, you know, I, I understand vSAN uh, as a as I don't want to call it a legacy product, but the 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 old licensing model, I guess, for lack of a better word. So mm -hmm. now let's move on to kind of today's topic of vSAN Plus. Um, so I'm an, I'm existing. You know, maybe I'm a three-tier customer. I don't, you know, I have my Nibble array, or maybe I'm a v existing vSAN customer. Um, why would I now look at vSAN Plus? You know, maybe we start there on, on what it is and how it differs from, you know, straight vSAN or vanilla vSAN. Yeah. So, um, I, I like we talked about in the last episode, uh, we introduced this uh, cloud console uh, to vSAN management. So you get the global view. Uh, you have all of your different vSAN arrays reporting back in or vSAN plus arrays uh, reporting back in. Um, but at its core, this is a licensing model. So we moved to subscription. Um, it is, uh, you know, cloud enabled, cloud, uh, you know, uh, enabled is, is really the only word I guess I can yep. say there. Uh, and so you've got these additional features and functionality that get added into the package. So, um, you know, a lot of times uh, customers will choose a vSAN architecture in remote offices, branch offices, uh, industrial sites where they don't necessarily want to run uh, a full array or, um, you know, everything can run over IP. So, uh, you know, you have a lot of these, you know, outlying sites that may be vSAN. So, your global inventory view uh, enabled by vSAN Plus is probably a, a large value for those customers. Um, you can also run vSAN in the data center. You know, it's certainly capable. Um, so if you're running it out in your edge locations, you may want compatibility to do replication back into your data center uh, for data protection and other things. Um, because it's hyper-converged, 
Uh, you can also do other services on top of it, like file services. So it makes it a great model for hosting things like DDI, uh, which of course, you know, we, we do a lot of here mm -hmm. at Zotegra. Uh, the file services that can run on vSAN is a location where you can put your user data, your profiles for users, any of those VHDs or things with our profile management solutions. And so um, th those are the reasons I think that, that vSAN becomes a really compelling uh, storage mm -hmm. offering. So you mentioned, uh, you had a one-liner there, you mentioned licensing real quick. Maybe we should have covered it in, in the, the uh, previous vSAN conversation without getting into you know dollars and donuts. Um, it's licensed on based on storage amount or per core or per CPU. Um, and do you know how that how that works? You know, old vSAN versus subscription vSAN? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, traditionally, uh, vSAN is licensed based on uh, two different web, two different models. So number of VMs, they have robo packaging where you can do VM based licensing, uh, which works really great for your branch offices, uh, or you can do it based on the number of CPUs. Uh, as you transition to vSAN plus, everything is going to be based on the number of cores, just like vSphere plus. Uh, and so, uh, you know, this this transition is really around the recognition that Intel and processors in general had this, uh, you know, explosion of cores that's happening. Um, and so under the perpetual licensing, uh, VMware had introduced the limit that a single socket CPU of perpetual is good for up to 32 cores. If you go beyond 32 cores, you need to layer on an additional socket uh, to cover those additional cores. So vSphere Plus is going to unlock you know, more hardware capabilities for you as a customer as you scale beyond that 32 core limit, uh, which is currently the, the limit that VMware imposes on perpetual licenses. Yeah, well, 32 cores, it seems it seems like a lot, but it's it's really not in the grand scheme of things with some of the monster AMD uh, CPUs coming out right now. It's Absolutely. And, and the the clock rate is increasing. So as I'm looking at hardware and specking out hardware for customers, we're seeing the clock speeds also, uh, you know, in the mid to two point something gigahertz, two, five, two, six at those massive number of cores. Um, so density again is increasing more and more on the CPU. And this is VMware's way of responding to that density change uh, over time. Okay, so we, we talked about, you know, the it's license per core essentially, um, but I also see there's a number of vSAN plus offerings, you know, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be enterprise software if there wasn't, you know, a uh, good, better, best kind of kind of offering. So maybe we can walk through that for a little bit, and, and we can go through. Um, I think they call it a standard, advanced, and I'm guessing enterprise. I can't remember the last one. Yeah. So um, when vSAN Plus first came out uh, at last June, so a year ago, um, it was the enterprise uh, offering. It was the all bones included sort of package. And so that's where VMware started uh, with its vSAN Plus. And then last December, they came out with vSAN Plus Standard and vSAN Plus Advanced. Um, and so they've got uh, very similar capabilities to what you see in the perpetual licensing suites. Uh, for deduplication and compression, you need advanced or enterprise. Um, you know, and, and so are really these three packages today align around uh, different uh, capabilities. So there's there's a great um, capability chart that VMware has out on its website, but vSAN plus standard is really targeted towards your hybrid deployments. Uh, vSAN plus advanced is more of that all flash. And then vSAN plus is really your full featured enterprise. Um, you're gonna have the file services functionality like HCI mesh, which remind me to talk about, it's a neat feature. Data at rest encryption, and then um, you know modern capabilities to use vSAN for things like Kubernetes clusters. That's gonna be your vSAN plus offering. Um, so HCI mesh, really interesting thing. Um, you know, you may have multiple vSAN clusters in an environment and one may be running at 80% capacity and your other running at 40% capacity. 
So vSAN has this capability of being able to share capacity between vSAN clusters. That's called HCI mesh. So you link the two clusters together and then cluster A can use that capacity from cluster B running at 40% uh, and share that across the wire. So um, one of the common complaints with it uh, in the past was that you have these islands of capacity and that's been with all different storage architectures. Um, but HCI mesh allows you to break out of that. So again, that's an enterprise level feature that exists only in the vSAN plus package. Um, so the, the, the HCI mesh, um, is that similar to uh, stretch clusters? So it's not, uh, it's actually just allowing cluster A to tap into the storage capacity of cluster B. It's um, not uh, synonymous with stretch clusters, but while we're on the topic, vSAN does support stretch clusters. So you can have three nodes inside A, three nodes inside B, and a witness located in, located in some other site. So that concept is fully supported within vSAN, um, but uh, this is a little different. HCI mesh okay. is just about tapping into the capacity in another cluster. So as long as you have a, you know, a supported stretch cluster, you can leverage the HCI mesh? No, actually they're two oh, okay. different topics. Two independent okay. topics. So um, stretch clusters is just a design concept within uh, vSAN, uh, as opposed to HCI mesh, which is more of a capability to allow one cluster to use the capacity from another cluster. Got it, got it, got it. Um, so if you have an existing vSAN customer today, what are the steps needed to move to vSAN plus? Or is it you know just a... When it comes license renewal time, is it just a matter of you know talking to your friendly, friendly Zintegra rep, and we'll walk you through the process? How does that how does that work? It is it's it's very simple. So uh, the transition uh, it is a two phase thing. So the first thing is your contract. Um, so just like vSphere Plus, when you're moving from perpetual licenses to your core based licenses. Um, they're following what I would call the Microsoft model. We saw Microsoft do this with both Windows Server and with SQL Server and other products. Uh, VMware will give you up to 32 cores for every perpetual license. Now, the initial grant is 16 cores. So if you have 16 cores or less on your existing hardware, you'll get 16 cores per every socket that you trade up from perpetual to subscription. If you have is, is that kind of a like a credit model? Is that the idea? Uh, it could be a credit model if you're running less than 16. Okay. Um, but in the event that you're running more than 16, so 24 or 32, for instance, on a processor or say 28, um, you show VMware your current core count on your hardware, they'll entitle you to all of those cores. Um, and in most of those, um, there are some ways to work it out. So you may only pay for 16 initially uh, in that grant. So that, that's also a great place where your partner can come in and help you with that transition on the contract side. Uh, and so, you know, the trade up uh, is a great place to be. So it may be worth increasing your core count on the underlying mm -hmm. hardware before you do a perpetual to uh, you know, we we certainly did some of those things uh, versus having to buy cores of SQL Server and things like that. Um, so there are ways to make it work to your advantage. Right. Okay. Um, this one, as we were preparing for for this podcast, I, I was looking at the the versioning of vSAN, and it looks like it's on vSAN eight right now. Mm -hmm. So I guess the the question is, um, if I'm, do you have to keep your your vSphere vCenter environment at the same version as vSAN? Are they can can they be independent? Give in mind a you know plus or minus a, a version or two. So it's going to be aligned to your vSphere version uh, more than your vCenter version. And so okay. your ESX version will kind of dictate the version of uh, vSAN that you also deploy. They're very closely integrated between the hypervisor and this storage package. Um, you know, everything uh, runs based on that vSphere storage layer. You can have vCenter sitting at a later version. Um, and so, you know, vCenter supports down versions uh, for multiple generations. Uh, it's currently vCenter 8, supports 7, 6, 7, 6, 5, you know, all the way down. So 
uh, you, you don't get tied to the vCenter version, uh, just to the ESX version. Uh, that's going to dictate your vSAN. Uh, the other thing I did want to touch on uh, during that transition, you've got your license. You do change the subscription license in vCenter. So as we're talking about the vCenter dependency here, you will change your licensing model. But that's a non-production impacting event. Um, it's something fairly easy to move from your perpetual license to your subscription license. And at that point, it's going to be communicating with the VMware Cloud Console uh, to do all licensing activities. Okay. Um, I, we had this conversation um, when we had our, our um, vSphere Plus conversation. Um, is vSAN no plus eventually going to go away, do you think? And everything's going to move to subscription modeling? You know, uh... I think the market's going to largely dictate that. I think as a company, VMware would probably like for that to happen. How aggressive they're going to be with it, I can't tell you. At the current time, Perpetual is still available for purchase. They have not announced any intention or dates uh, that Perpetual would not be available. So mm -hmm. um, I would say as of today, the 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 outlook in the crystal ball is cloudy. We we don't right. know for sure um, what their final intention is. So let me ask this question a different way. Um, you're you're an existing v VMware customer. You don't have vSAN. You want vSAN. What are you buying? Are you going to buy vSAN or vSAN Plus? So I think uh, it's going to be based on what you do for vSphere. If you're a vSphere Plus customer, you're going to go with vSAN Plus. Um, I don't know that you have to. Um, I think as a perpetual customer, you may be able to use vSAN plus licensing. Um, but I, I would suspect if you're perpetual, you're going to keep perpetual for both. And if you're, um, if you're subscription, you're going to keep subscription for both. So uh, I expect that just from a licensing perspective, it would be uh, easier to manage that way. Right. Just looking at the at the vSAN Plus blog, it, it's less than a year old. So, you know, maybe I'm asking these questions a bit prematurely where, you know, it haven't, hasn't even had its first birthday yet. You know, where <laughs> is the is the one year old going to kill off the, you know, the 10 year old, her role vSAN is. So it's interesting conversations for sure. Yeah. And, you know, last uh, episode, we also talked a little bit about you know compliance rules and where it's data located and locality. And that applies here as well. So I'd love to circle back. Had a great conversation with a VMware resource. And um, I'd love to, to share kind of what we talked about. Yes, uh, please. Let's go. So you're in Canada. I'm in the U.S. And so this is a perfect example of, of a company that has different data locality laws. You know, it certainly becomes more of an issue as you go to Europe uh, with GDPR and mm -hmm. things like that uh, in play. So... Um, for us, when we do a purchase order or when we do a purchase, we just need to be working with our local VMware resources. So for you in Canada, you're going to be working with your Canadian team through a Canadian distributor. That's mm -hmm. going to make sure that your data is located in country and your cloud services are hosted in country. So um, it's a actually pretty simple conversation, um, but it really has to do with where we issue the PO and where we issue the order. Um, if on the flip side, you ordered from us in the U.S. Uh, through our U.S. distributor, your cloud service is going to be here in the U.S. And so as a customer, just make sure that you're working with your local team if you have any data locality uh, concerns, and that will make sure that your cloud services are hosted in the correct region. Right. So I know with multinationals, it, it, makes, it makes a difference because you know, we work with a lot of multinational companies, you know, collectively, you and I. And so uh, we we have to make sure that we're issuing the the orders in the correct region. Well, that's even good for us, you know, because you know within Zintegra itself we have Zintegra Canada, Zintegra US, Zintegra India. So we just got to make sure we understand um, uh, the ramifications of where we where we issue POs for. Because you know at the end of the day we do buy hardware, we do buy software as well to support our internal operations. Um, so that's that's great to know. Yeah, um, in my previous life I, I had both US operations and an international division based out of London. And so they were susceptible to a lot of those data locality laws. And so um, in the perpetual VMware world, 
we actually wrote into our enterprise license agreement that we could share uh, up to X percent of our licenses with the London subsidiary. You know, this, this undermines some of those contractual agreements. Uh, we did that for simplicity. Uh, but if they needed their own cloud console for their connected clusters based in the UK, we would have needed to do a separate purchase, a separate uh, agreement uh, that is based in the UK. So there are certainly concerns here for customers. And uh, if you're confused at all about that as a customer, I would say, you know, it, work with us, work with Zintegra, and we'll help you navigate those things along with the VMware team to make sure that you've got what you need for compliance reasons. Right. And I, I think it's it's worth mentioning that, you know, even though you're using, um, you know, the management infrastructure of, of VMware Cloud, um, that doesn't necessarily mean your data is going to be in the cloud. Um, you know, you can still run your data on-prem, um, but certainly some of the, the management functionality and maybe some telemetry data um, will be in the cloud. Um, yeah. So again, again, back to your point, Phil, is, is, you know, have these conversations with, your, with the team, with, you know, either us or our, our, we'll bring in VMware on your behalf and we have, the, you know, a group conversation to actually, you know, hammer out the details of data sovereignty, data location, um, GDPR, you know, we, every time you go to a website, you got to accept cookies. Thanks to that. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's become sort of the, the normal thing. Every time you visit a website, except decline, uh, you know, and, and, yeah, I don't know. I think you're an iPhone user too. You know, now we have, you know, the opt out for ads. So, um, you know, that that's come to that platform as well. So it's it's like we're always opting in or opting out of something, it seems like. Um, you know, we got to talk offline. I didn't know it was an opt out for ads on my phone. You gotta, <laughs> I'm going to have to do some Googling when we're done. <laughs> well, I think that's a great place for us to close on this episode. Um, talking vSAN Plus. Barry, I appreciate it as always. Uh, your questions are, are great. Uh, it's a great way for us to, to get the information out. And so, Really wanted to say I appreciate you joining me. Oh, happy to be here. And for the for the folks watching uh, on, on the YouTube, you don't have to guess which guy's in Canada. I'm the guy with the big big woolly sweater on and Phil's in a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> that is right. Phil has uh, got the fan on at full blast, um, trying to stay cool down here in the Carolinas. So, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. We're recording this June 20th. I still have the heat on in my house, you know, day before the first day of summer. And, uh, you know, it's nuts. But the joys well, of Canada, right? Exactly right. Well, as an aside, my, I mentioned to you earlier, my wife is cruising around Norway right now. She's in her short sleeves uh, talking about how nice it is off the coast of Norway. So she's entered into the Arctic Circle, and I think she's warmer than you, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bro, salt in the wound, salt in the wound. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody, for joining us, and uh, we'll see you on the next episode.